All right, well, welcome everyone. I hope you're having a great day. My name is Alper and I'm the Education Content Manager for Code Day Labs. Um, I, um, I'm happy to welcome David, who will be talking to you guys about AI, um, some fundamentals, some ethics, um, and kind of everything you need to start your first hands-on project. Um, David, if you'd like to introduce yourself a bit more and then we can get going. Yeah, happy to do so. Uh, so hi everyone, my name's David. I am an instructor at a program called InSpirit AI. Our program is uh, educational. It's geared towards originally high school students, but now it's anyone from second grade to college students, uh, teaching them the fundamentals of artificial intelligence. Um, in the course of the program, we cover a lot of the fundamental concepts in AI, and then we build up to projects that students create. Um, some projects are detecting exoplanets with AI, predicting the stock market based on financial news, detecting uh, skin cancer based on images, training uh, cars to detect objects for like self-driving cars. There's a lot of really cool stuff that we do. Um, other than that, I graduated from Yale in 2021, so last year, and I'm currently living in Washington, DC. Um, yeah, okay, well, I think, that is enough for a, a quick introduction. At this point, I'm going to share my screen and begin the actual talk today. It's a, about AI for all, goes through um, what is AI, how it can be applied, the ethics of it, and some starters on how to become a little bit more involved in the world of AI. As a note before we begin, questions are welcome. Questions are welcome at any point throughout the talk. Um, there's a Q&A function that you should have on Zoom. Just post your question there whenever it comes to you, and then um, Alper will read it out to me, or maybe I'll catch it myself, and we'll just address each question as they come up. So if you ever have a question, post it as soon as you think of it. Okay, let's get this screen share going. Hopefully it's working all right. Okay, AI for all. A gentle introduction to artificial intelligence. First things first, our roadmap. We might go a bit over these times because I know we have an hour, um, but this is kind of rough. There'll also be questions throughout. I'm gonna talk about introduction to AI. That's what it is, how to use it ethically. Um, and then we're gonna spend some time talking about applications of AI, AI plus X, where X could be whatever you want it to be. X could be um, environmental studies or medicine or uh, economy or whatever it is that you are interested in. And then finally, tools for education. I have so many tools, so many resources. I'm gonna share some of them with you uh, and give you a glimpse of what's out there if you wanna educate yourself about AI. Okay. Artificial intelligence. Uh, so the Quick rough and ready definition is any machine that can interpret data, learn from that data, and use the knowledge from that data to achieve something specific. Artificial intelligence is uh, kind of like a traditional program, you know, uh, one that you might program yourself in a really quick Python or, or C or Java notebook. Um, but artificial intelligence is different because it has some control over how it solves a problem. So usually when you're programming something, you tell it exactly how to solve a problem. You say, hey, find the largest number in this list. And you teach it exactly how to find the largest number. But artificial intelligence uses a lot of data to figure out its own solution to a problem going to look more into what that means in a bit. You have most definitely seen AI in the wild. You've seen it in voice assistants. Uh, if you have an iPhone like me, you've seen it on Siri or Alexa or um, Google, like, okay, Google. Self-driving cars, if you live in the San Francisco area, you've seen Waymos around there, I'm sure. But even if you don't, you've probably heard of the self-driving cars that Tesla is producing. And it's not just Tesla anymore. Uh, Self-driving cars are becoming more and more common. I would say in 10, 15 
maybe a little bit more years, uh, you're gonna see those maybe more often than human driven cars. Recommendation algorithms are a classic. If you're on TikTok, if you're on YouTube, if you're watching Netflix or choosing products to buy on Amazon, you are most definitely encountering recommendation algorithms, advertisements, application filters, deep fakes. Um, you may have heard of this. It's when you can take a video of someone and then project someone else's face onto that or even create a new video using someone else's face. Obviously there are ethical concerns there that we'll talk about. These are uh, all examples that I think you are at least somewhat familiar with. Here's a quote from Andrew Ng, a Stanford professor and founder of Coursera. Just as electricity transformed almost everything 100 years ago, today I actually have a hard time thinking of an industry that I don't think AI will transform in the next several years. Tricky sentence, a few double negatives there, but I think you get the idea. AI as a revolutionary invention on the scale of electricity. Uh, that's pretty revolutionary. Another important point is investments. Why do people care about AI? Well, partly there's a ton of money in AI right now, and a lot of companies are trying to develop AI at a breakneck pace. You can see how quickly that uh, investment has gone ever since about 2013. So breakneck pace, moving really quickly, advancing extremely rapidly, that is generally cause for concern. Uh, we obviously want technology to improve quickly. We wanna solve problems fast, but we don't want to do it in a way that's unethical. And that's gonna be a main focus here. Just a few items that you can see here. Privacy is a major issue, especially when we're talking about things like recommendation algorithms or algorithms that diagnose diseases. Those are very, very predicated on personal data that you may or may not want to share. Fake media, deep fakes, we were talking about this. Um, Over-reliance on AI and AI taking jobs away from humans. Uh, automation in the workplace is something that you've probably also heard about. Algorithmic bias, making sure that our AI algorithms aren't perpetuating the biases that we see in our world around us. These are major concerns that no one has a great answer to, to be honest with you. Um, we have ways to address some of these issues, but it's something we're still working on. For example, algorithmic bias. If there is bias in our world that is pervasive and almost inescapable, then there's bias in our data too, the data that we use to capture that world. So how do we remove bias from data? It's hard. It's not something that you can easily wave away. Okay, so what do we actually mean by artificial intelligence? I promised you that I'd get into this in a bit more detail. So let's get into that. This is kind of a fun video. So there are two types of artificial intelligence. Narrow artificial intelligence. That's what exists, that's what we have. That's when you are giving a very straightforward task to an AI. Something like, can you tell this person who's driving a car and is distracted from this person who's driving a car and paying attention? That's a narrow specific problem. General AI is much closer to what you and I, we humans have. That's trying to train an AI that can write poetry and can then use that poetry to make a painting and then can make that painting and then write an essay about that painting. And all the while it's creating a new theory of economics. It's something that can accomplish many tasks and gain information from everything around it in the world. This does not exist. I really want to emphasize that. Artificial intelligence is not at the point where it's as smart as or smarter than humans, where it can accomplish anything a human can. AI is still narrow. It's still for specific problems. Maybe that'll change, but it hasn't yet. 
So machine learning is another phrase you might have heard, and you're probably wondering, what is the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? I've heard both of these, I'm not quite sure what they mean. So artificial intelligence is this broad field. Like I said, it has narrow artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. It's kind of an umbrella phrase. Machine learning is a bit more specific. Machine learning is specifically, as it says here, computer systems that learn and improve based on algorithms and statistical models. Machine learning and artificial intelligence are really similar in today's world, but maybe in 50 years, machine learning will be treated as like the infancy and AI is the big, crazy, super powerful thing. Um, uh, the type of things you see in movies. Okay, so there are uh, three types of machine learning that I wanna talk about. We're gonna a little bit dive into these, um, but I wanna give you a brief primer on the three types. Here's a little bit of vocabulary for you. Uh, there are three big things that a narrow artificial intelligence can accomplish at this point in time. One is making predictions, one is finding patterns, and one is making decisions. I'm gonna explain more what those mean. Making predictions, that's uh, the most common type of artificial intelligence. That's, as I said, diagnosing a disease based on a patient's medical data. That's predicting the price of a stock in the next five minutes or the next 10 years based on how the stock has performed previously. Detecting patterns is a little bit more complicated. That's when we give an AI a lot more data, uh, orders of magnitude more data, and we just see what it can find. Uh, this is kind of similar, but we've done this with some AI models and it will discover techniques and things we have not found yet solutions to math problems that we have not discovered, ways to detect disease that we have not realized or detected yet. Um, this is kind of the closest thing to that general AI, something that can solve a problem in a way that even we can't solve that problem. Finally, decision-making AI. That's, uh, imagine an AI that plays a video game. Uh, it's one that can take information and then make rapid fire decisions based on that information, um, also commonly used in robotics. In case you want to know the, the specific vocabulary for this, predictions is called supervised learning, patterns is called unsupervised learning, and decisions is called reinforcement learning. Maybe you've caught a couple of those I don't know, somewhere on the internet, you've seen that before. That's what it means. Here it is, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So I'm not gonna get in a ton of detail about this other than saying that supervised learning is predictions, unsupervised learning is detecting patterns, reinforcement learning is detecting uh, or making decisions. Okay. Uh, might be good to pause here because we're going to enter a new section in a second. Any questions any of you have? Again, you have that Q&A uh, with you. I know that right now it's been a lot of definitions. It's important to lay a really solid foundational groundwork before we start talking about applications in AI. So any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Okay, if anyone has any questions, feel free to bring them up later, but I'll step forward in the slides. So supervised learning, uh, common examples, predicting house prices, uh, height of trees, medical diagnoses, I've talked about that a few times now, uh, Uber prices. So when you are looking up how much is an Uber from the airport to my house gonna cost on, I don't know, Tuesday when I fly home, well, it's supervised learning that predicts 
how many people will be requesting Ubers at that time, and thus what the cost of that Uber is going to be. There is also a kind of a dichotomy I want to tease out here between what an AI does and what a human does. So a human might learn how to speak, might learn how to uh, enjoy something, enjoy a movie or going to Costco. It's based on the data that that human has experienced. Human has gained information from, let's say their parent talking to them and learns how to predict next words based on that conversation. Oh, I see a question now from Nikolai. Uh, does machine learning require significant computational resources? Yes. So there are two big things computationally that machine learning requires, Nikolai, at least the advanced machine learning models. The first is a inordinate amount of data. Uh, to build a cutting edge machine learning model, you're going to need ridiculous amounts of data. For example, if you wanna build a model that can produce language, um, you might've seen something like that before, maybe Siri is an example. You're gonna need billions of words, maybe even more, maybe tens of billions of words to create those conversations and to make it sound like a human. It's also going to require a lot of computational power when it's making each prediction or calculation. So whenever Siri decides how to respond to you, that's actually a very computationally intensive thing to do. Um, some are even more complex, like trying to figure out how a protein molecule is going to fold, um, something called the protein folding problem. Predicting that is unbelievably intensive computationally. That's why companies pay millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars for cloud computing power and massive servers to process all of this information. Great question. Uh, so unsupervised learning patterns, um, trying to discover chemical compounds is a really good example of this because this is where an AI can find something that we haven't found yet. An AI can find a, a new drug, a new uh, medicine that humans have not discovered yet using unsupervised learning. You as a human might uh, do unsupervised learning when you are trying to solve a crime. Uh, you have a ton of information and you're going to use that information to find a solution that no one has yet. You might have it uh, when you are trying to determine if you like someone or not. You have all the information from that person and you need to make a decision. Is this a person who I like, who I trust, who I wanna spend time with? Finally, reinforcement learning. This is what I mentioned like a video game. Uh, that's actually a really common application of it. Training an AI to make decisions based on the information it currently has. You might have it uh, if you ever play games uh, or if you ever cook, you want to decide how long am I gonna leave this cake in the oven before I take it out? The only way you can really know that unless you have instructions is based on your previous experience. Last time I left the cake in for an hour and it burnt. The time before that I left it in for 10 minutes and it was raw. So now I'll leave it in for 30 minutes and hopefully it'll be okay trying to make new decisions based on past experiences. Sounds obvious, but it's actually a, a really powerful algorithm. Okay, so this talk is titled AI for All. It's titled AI for All because AI affects everyone, so it should be understood and utilized by everyone. That's why I wanna focus on some specific examples of how AI can affect something you might be interested in. In fact, uh, I think every single one or almost every single one of these examples in Spirit AI has a project on how AI applies to this topic. So this is the next portion of the talk, AI plus X. Here are lots of examples. AI and education. So AI and education are more intertwined than you may think because AI and education both involve taking a lot of information, 
and synthesizing it, understanding what matters, what doesn't, producing some output. It can also uh, help teachers or school administrators learn what is effective in teaching students how to read or closing achievement gaps or making sure that student test scores actually reflect their performances in class, uh, trying to make sure that there isn't a gap between what students are capable of and what they're actually achieving. AI in the environment is, I think, one of the most salient examples of the power of AI. Um, when people are thinking about major problems that the world faces right now, climate change is usually number one or number two. Um, and AI is often talked about as one of the really powerful things that might help us in the climate crisis. Uh, the hope is that AI can help make sure our farming is as efficient and sustainable as possible. Misuse of agrable land is going to be a major issue when we try to feed uh, somewhere between 10 to 12 billion people in 50 years. Um, also trying to detect criminal deforestation. Uh, you'd be surprised maybe to hear that criminal deforestation is a thing, deforesting land that companies do not have a permit to do so. Um, it's going to be hopefully one of the many tools in our kit when we're combating climate change. AI and arts and music. This one's my favorite one actually, because it's the example a lot of people use when they say, AI cannot help us in art. AI cannot write music for us. AI cannot act in a play. Well, kind of it can. Um, AI has created new artwork. AI has created new songs, new entire creations, and songs specifically in the style of an existing artist. Um, we have a few projects at Inspirit AI specifically looking at how AI affects art and music, also with music recommendation algorithms like Spotify or Apple Music. AI and journalism, um, it's gonna be important when we are inundated with fake news to know what is true and how it was determined. That's actually something AI can help with, uh, detecting fake news and making sure that content is moderated so that Twitter isn't getting flooded with hate speech or that um, your Facebook feed isn't getting flooded with misinformation. Again, something that is in the news a lot if you're uh, paying attention to, I don't know, anything going on in the content moderation of big tech companies. AI and astronomy is one of the really cool ones right now because the uh, web telescope from NASA is doing a lot of this stuff actually. So one of the things that AI can accomplish is detecting exoplanets. That's planets orbiting other stars that might have habitable life on them. Uh, uh, obviously we don't know, but it's possible. Um, if we take the data that we have about stars, data that uh, observatories like the Webb Telescope can gather, we can make predictions on whether those planets have um, exoplanets around them. We can also make even more calculations. We can know how large the planet is, how far that planet is from its orbiting star. We can even determine the atmosphere of those planets, which means we can determine if there is water on those planets. All things that are going to be, I think, really, really, really cool because we'll see them unfold in the next few months, few years with this new web telescope. AI and medicine, I've kind of talked about this throughout the talk, discovering new drugs or new medicines, understanding how diseases come to be, how they affect the body, even optimizing ambulance patterns, uh, how an ambulance reaches a patient, or optimizing how nurses triage different patients in the emergency room. Um, we also have many projects at InSpirit AI on this, um, especially in diagnosing diseases like pneumonia or skin cancer or breast cancer. Actually, we have another project there. AI and political science is a really nice one because it's another one that people don't really expect. Uh, it can 
detect bias in our current judicial or legal system. Uh, it can also predict voter turnout. Obviously, that's important if you're a political consultant trying to choose who the next president is going to be or, or support that candidate. It can also be useful in detecting bias in media outlets and trying to make sure that we live in a fair and well-informed world. AI and engineering, kind of going through these rapid fire now because I hope you get the idea of how many applications they are, making sure that our uh, new technology is well optimized, is safe, is rigorously tested. That's something AI can help with. Um, biggest example right now is self-driving cars, which are a marvel of engineering, software development, electrical engineering. Um, it's really cool stuff. I could talk about self-driving cars for a while. AI and biology, tracking uh, diseases, discovering how different molecules interact with each other, uh, trying to make sure that we have a really good understanding of biology of humans and of other animals. Literature, um, again, one that people don't expect, but AI is fully capable of reading, comprehending, and generating literature. That's something that has really come about in only the past few years. In fact, you might've even seen in the news a Google engineer who claimed that a chatbot Google created is sent. So that's, oh, I think I froze there. Oh, I think I'm back now. Um, I was saying that there is a Google engineer who believes a Google chatbot is sentient. Uh, that was recently in the news. And it was kind of like this. It's a chatbot that had read billions of human conversations and learned to predict what humans generally say. And so it could hold a conversation with you in much the same way a human could. You can choose for yourself whether you think something like that is sentient or not. To be fair, most researchers think that is not sentient, but at least one thinks it is. So um, moving forward, AI and finance, this is one of the biggest ones. Predicting the stock market is something that's obviously a pretty valuable thing if you can do it accurately and consistently. So that's a major focus of artificial intelligence. And I think the stock market has been in the news a lot as it pretty much always is you can see why this would be useful to know what's coming next. Psychology, uh, making sure that AI can uh, detect what diseases someone might have mentally um, and also how to treat mental health issues. So there are AI therapy chatbots, little bit uncanny valley, but they exist and they're actually proven to be fairly effective if the participant is willing and able to engage with that chatbot kind of the same way that they would engage with a therapist. And AI and ethics. We've talked about this uh, a little bit before, but there are a lot of ways that AI can either solve ethical issues or create new ethical issues. Um, a few of them is how AI might help decide what college you get into, what job you get, what uh, place you live in, who gets approved for a bank loan or not. Also, what sentence you might get if you were arrested and charged and convicted of a crime. Um, also, who gets money from the government on some welfare program or uh, what content is allowed on major platforms. So these are major issues. These are issues that I think you are more and more encountering if you're paying attention to this AI world. And the big question is who is accountable when AI goes wrong? Is it the company? Is it the programmer? Is it the machine itself? No one's quite sure. And it's kind of up to each of us to decide and eventually make decisions on. Okay. So uh, hopefully, like I said, you get the idea. There are so many applications of artificial intelligence. There are uh, ways that it's affecting our world now and also ways that it will affect our world in the near future. At this point in the talk, uh, I'm gonna take about 15 minutes, um, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less 
to go over some artificial intelligence tools that you might use. Remember, if you have any questions about any of this, throw them in the chat. Um, let's look into some tools that you might wanna use. So there are a lot of really short demos of how artificial intelligence can work that you can just explore in five minutes or less. I wanna look at one that's kind of fun. It's called Quick Draw. So I'm gonna put this one, uh, don't know if I can put it in the chat. So I'll just click the link here and you can look it up on your own. Quick Draw is kind of fun. It's an AI essentially trained in Pictionary. You've never played that game before. You draw something, uh, maybe you draw a cat or you draw a pencil or you draw a book and the AI tries to correctly identify what it is you're drawing. So I'll just demo it for you really quickly. I'm gonna to try to draw an envelope. Let's see how I do. I see elbow huh? or foot or square or suitcase. Oh, I know it's envelope. There we go. I'll try one more. I'll try belt. So let's see. I see line. I see computer keyboard or springboard or swimming pool. Oh, I know it's belt. Okay. So my drawings aren't very good, but it can still pick them up. A lot of the resources that are here are actually, um, well, they're all publicly available, but they're all AI powered as well. And they're really easy to use. Uh, a couple that you might've also seen are AI that can create images based on a text prompt or this one, which I'm also gonna take a look at, which can create language. Oh, here, I think this is the correct website. Uh, it can create language based on some sample text I give it. So let's say unicorns that speak English. I give it some seed text and it produces <laughs> what seems to be uh, text based on online news articles. <laughs> okay. So this one wasn't as interesting. Let's try again. Let's try Elon Musk's debut album. So this is actually pretty interesting because it's obviously kind of plausible, but it's also accurate. Uh, the Boring Company is a real company owned by Elon Musk. The album's hosted on Dropbox. It's kind of bizarre. Uh, 10 tracks featuring Musk reading his musings on a variety of topics. Now, as it goes on, it gets a little bit lost, uh, as you might see. It says Elon Musk is releasing a debut album, but then it says these songs were released in September 2018. They were all released on September 13th. <laughs> They would be more pedestrian and relatable than other Elon Musk's would be. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's still kind of interesting. Okay. So teaching AI. If you want to learn more about artificial intelligence, if you want to actually absorb this information in more than a five minute demo, a lot of these resources are great. I wanna point out two, code.org, uh, you might've heard of it. It's got so many resources. It's uh, unbelievable. It's all available. And it has lots of modules on artificial intelligence, which is really cool. Also, I've got a plug in Spirit AI. Uh, oh, looks like that link's deprecated. In Spirit AI has lots of blogs about artificial intelligence written by instructors talking about how artificial intelligence is useful in the real world, their own research in artificial intelligence. Really encourage you to check out our website. I'll link it in a little bit. So this is kind of uh, different resources. There's one that I want to focus on because I think it's really cool looking at what the future of artificial intelligence will be. This one, Jobs of the Future, 
is a really cool website because it's just forecasting what might be a job, a function that humans have to fulfill that doesn't exist now. And if you read some of these, they're pretty interesting. They're almost sci-fi. Uh, some of them are cool, like someone who interprets and explains how artificial intelligence algorithms work, but also someone who tries to emulate nature in fighting climate change. Uh, someone who is farming crickets for high protein food. I don't know, maybe we'll be eating crickets in the future. Uh, data waste recycler, someone who receives deleted data and sees if they can use it for another purpose so that we can conserve space and memory on the cloud. De-extinction geneticist, someone who can bring a species back from extinction that actually already exists in a few capacities. Another one to point out, again, if you're thinking about learning more about AI, Crash Course AI. You might've heard of Crash Course. They do a ton of stuff. Uh, it was originally built just for history, but now they have subjects in everything, including artificial intelligence. Um, kind of cool, gives you a really solid overview of how this stuff works. A few more snacks. These are just kind of bonuses. Um, Dolly is one that you might have heard of. This is a algorithm that can create images based on just a text prompt, like an armchair in the shape of an avocado or a baby daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog. Again, these are images that are AI generated. So that's, that's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, I think that is a lot of resources. Um, I can link these slides after this talk so that you can actually play with these rather than just seeing me demo them. Um, the last one to point out that I really recommend if you wanna get into coding AI, but you want a, oh, I think it's google.colab.com, whoops. All right. Nope. Uh, Google Colab is just a really useful website if you want to begin coding right now. If you want to be uh, coding in a other environment, oh, froze again. Uh, if you want to code in a browser-based environment, Google Colab is one of the best ones out there. The Inspired AI program is built in Google Collaboratory with notebooks like this where you are determining whether a Yelp review is positive or negative based on its text. So if you wanna build AI in your browser just at home, I cannot recommend Google Colab highly enough. And uh, building your own AI projects, there's a lot of resources. AI for all is free, it's available. Um, online to anyone, or of course, there's the InSpirit AI program. Uh, so I'll talk about the InSpirit AI program just really quickly here, uh, and then that'll be about it for the talk, time for any questions. The InSpirit AI program, as I said, has programs from second grade all the way to college, but our main focus is on high schoolers. We make sure that students learn the fundamentals of artificial intelligence in small groups with an instructor, they're guided through how to use it ethically, the actual core concepts that all AI scientists are using, and then how to build an AI project with that knowledge. It's a program that I think can be really, really valuable, especially in high school, because you aren't going to really work with artificial intelligence until college uh, in most cases. So to get a leg up on that, to have some coding experience, to have some artificial intelligence experience very early on in your career, that is so valuable. It's gonna be um, something that can really help you in college, in your career afterwards, whether you go to grad school or just get a full-time job as an engineer or whatever it is that you wanna do in artificial intelligence. Um, so it's a really great program. I've loved working with it. And if you're interested, uh, I'm definitely happy to talk with you more about the program. But okay. Uh, again, if you want to contact us, our website is inspiritai.com. 
Um, I can also give you my email. It's pretty easy. It's just david at inspiritai.com. Definitely feel free to, to shoot me an email, but thanks again. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to stick around. I know I wrapped up a little bit early, but uh, yeah, it's been great being here and talking with all of you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, David. Um, yeah, as David said, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, now is the time to ask. So David has a lot of experience with AI, with computer vision and anything machine learning related. So if you want to ask about that or how we got to where he is today, um, just go ahead. Yeah, again, happy to answer any questions. I'm here to just talk about these concepts with you and, and hopefully encourage you to learn a little bit more and, and have a better understanding of what these concepts are, how to apply artificial intelligence uh, to whatever it is that you're interested in. So yeah, any questions? So maybe to get the conversation started, um, I'll ask one. So for people who are brand new to AI, this whole maybe overwhelming world of AI, um, yeah. how would you say they kind of get started and um, I don't know, uh, just kind of start this path into maybe a career in AI or related career as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you're just learning about this for the first time, aren't familiar with artificial intelligence at all, I totally understand. I was I was right there and really I'm I'm impressed because I wasn't aware of these concepts until I was a junior in college. Um, so you're way ahead of me. Um, if you are trying to learn more about artificial intelligence, I'd say one of the very first things to do is just to learn more about the concepts. And the concepts are easy to come across. Uh, I have a ton of resources in the slides I was just sharing, but I also have a lot of resources uh, or there are a lot of resources out in the world. If you just go on YouTube, look up the crash course on artificial intelligence or um, three blue, one brown, if you've ever heard of it, has a lot of videos on it. There's many resources to just have you learning what the world is like in artificial intelligence, what it can do, what it can't do, how it works. But once you feel like you have at least an intuition, on how artificial intelligence works, that's when I encourage you to see if you can find ways to implement it in code. And there are a couple ways to do that. First is just trying to learn more yourself on your own with free internet resources. Uh, some big ones, Coursera has a free course on artificial intelligence, it's from Stanford. Um, and MIT also has a course on machine learning. Um, those are both obviously advanced because they're from Stanford and MIT, but it's nice because it's all online. You can go through it at your own pace and I promise you can handle it as long as you are paying attention and engaged and motivated enough to stick with it. Those courses will help you learn how to code artificial intelligence. You can also just look up examples of it on GitHub or wherever you want to find examples of code. But if you want a more guided experience, there are programs like Inspirit AI where you'll be matched with an instructor, who will work with you on how to use AI, work with you on how to build AI and code, to gather data, um, to implement whatever algorithm it is. So whether you wanna do it on your own, just with free resources, or you want an instructor or a mentor to guide you through that, there are so many opportunities to learn more about this stuff uh, all throughout the internet. So yeah, great question. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's see. Okay, so Nikolai is asking a bit of a side question with AIs getting more and more sophisticated at creating false content on one hand and AIs designed to recognize such content on the other, where might we eventually end up? Yeah, so Nikolai, that's a great question. Um, this is, I think, uh, very typical of almost any technology. So technology is not a good thing inherently. Technology is a tool. And a tool can be used for good things, but it can also be used for bad. So right now, AI is used to, as you said, develop 
deep fake videos where I can make the president say false things to mislead the audience, or I can make uh, fake news that sounds really convincing and true, but it's not, and I'm using it to deceive people or to make myself money. At the same time, we have AI that is used uh, for good, AI to detect deep fake videos or AI to detect fake news. I don't think we'll ever see one much better than the other. I don't think we'll ever see a world in which AI is only used for good or only used for bad. It's just a inescapable fact of the rapidly evolving and innovative world we live in where technology is used by so many players, so many people in so many ways that we're always going to have bad actors. Uh, and that's unfortunate, but it's true. So the hope, Nikolai, is that the good side of AI wins out and we can detect and, and uh, defeat like fake news or false content. But I would not be so sure that that's how it's actually going to play out. Um, Hopefully, what I think maybe is a bit more realistic is we become a little less uh, in an echo chamber when it comes to news. We become a little bit more open to new sources. And if we are paying attention to multiple news sources, then we're maybe less likely to get caught by one fake news source, one bad actor. Hopefully, there'll be enough information that some of that good actually true content gets to us and we can learn to distinguish the two um, but it's a great question i wish i had a more optimistic answer nikolai uh, any other uh questions or comments it could also be about um as alper was saying something in my experience or something that maybe you're curious about when it comes to artificial intelligence or just making a career in whatever it is you're interested in. Maybe it's not artificial intelligence, but maybe it's something that you'd still like to talk about regardless. So maybe on that topic, um, after you graduated undergrad, mm -hmm. um, so from your experience, maybe personal experience or what you heard from friends, mm -hmm. um, how do you think people should go on with making a career in the AI industry, like post-graduation, um, any tips on that? Because most of these students are um, in college right now, so they're kind of trying to figure out what to do after they graduate. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when I was in college, I did not expect to make a career in artificial intelligence. I was mostly focused on, uh, I studied mathematics, and I was trying to figure out if I like mathematics or computer science. Um, Artificial intelligence is a weird field because it's growing really rapidly so that uh, it's not very established yet, which means a couple big things. One, you can do meaningful research in artificial intelligence kind of quickly. Uh, you can, if you wanna go get a PhD in artificial intelligence, which is obviously a pretty big commitment, um, you can work on really cutting edge stuff and contribute to very meaningful research. Um, it's exciting. It's an early time in this rapidly growing, highly powerful field. Um, but if you're interested more in pursuing a career and trying to get a job as maybe a artificial intelligence engineer or a software engineer or whatever it is that you're interested in, I would say a couple big things. One is to have some experience in that field it doesn't have to be an internship, but it probably it ideally is like related to whatever it is that you're interested in. So let's say I want to go be a software engineer. Well, it'd be great if I had experience building some product or building some project in artificial intelligence or in, uh, if it's not artificial intelligence, maybe it's in optimization problems or maybe it's in uh, data analysis, or maybe it's in some subject, doesn't have to be super specific. Because once you have a project or two or three, then you can go to an employer and say, hey, I can do this job and here's why, because I've done something similar before, because I have worked with 
uh, all these cool algorithms, these cool coding languages. I worked with this professor and we built something really meaningful. So once you have that solid base of experience, whether it's through internships or projects or research, that's something that you can go turn into in a new internship or a new job. So again, the question might be, how do I get that experience? Well, if, uh, you know, internship is obviously a, a classic answer, but you could do research too. I guarantee you, your professors have research that they're working on or your TAs. Just send some cold emails, see if they need a lab assistant, see if they need someone to help them design an algorithm or, or to work on some problem. And I really promise you that some of them, maybe even lots of them, would love some help. And that help can become that experience. Uh, also, just taking classes that are challenging, that will involve working on this really cool stuff that you can then say, not only I'm going to go show this to an employer and show them, hey, I can actually do this work, but also to make sure you like it, to make sure that you want to be working on projects like this as a career. So gaining experience is kind of the really big thing. Obviously, gaining experience isn't easy, but I actually think it's really a lot easier when you're in college because it doesn't have to be through work. It can be through classes, it can be through research, it can be through personal projects, uh, even something that you just make on your own time on the weekends or whatever. Um, it, it's really wide open to you. I promise you have the resources at your university. It's just a matter of going out, putting yourself out there, reaching out to lots of people and seeing if anyone needs help and anyone wants to bring you on to uh, work on a research project, work in a lab, take a class, whatever it is. So yeah, that's that's my quick advice in a nutshell, yeah. Uh, looks like I have one more question. Um, might be the last question, uh, just based on the time. What undergrad classes turned out to be the most useful for your career? I've heard that a good understanding of linear algebra is essential for that field. Would you agree with that? So uh, the first part, the classes that I found useful, I took classes in neural networks and linguistics on, uh, on using different algorithms, on data structures, on programming techniques, uh, classes that kind of, as I was saying, gave me that really meaningful experience where I built projects or I designed algorithms or I solved problems that I could then show to someone, to an employer and say, hey, look, I've done this before. I can solve your problem or do whatever it is that you need me to do. Um, on the point of linear algebra specifically, I love linear algebra. Like I said, I studied mathematics. Linear algebra is my favorite field in mathematics. It is really important if your work involves really nitty gritty getting into the weeds of artificial intelligence. Um, it might not. So let's go back to what I was saying before. If you want to go get a PhD in artificial intelligence, then yeah, you probably want a really solid understanding of linear algebra because you are going to be working at a really low level, tinkering with your neural network, trying to make it as efficient as possible. But if you are a uh, working in industry, working as a machine learning engineer, uh, it's important, but it's not as important. You aren't doing research. You aren't uh, trying to optimize things perfectly. Instead, you're trying to take what already exists and apply it to a new problem or a new data set. So I would say linear algebra, I love it. It's really cool. It's definitely important, but it depends on what you want to do uh, if you really want to go full out on linear algebra. That being said, if there's an intro course, please take it. Linear algebra is so cool. At least get one class of experience with it because it's really interesting, makes you look at math in a whole new way, in my opinion, at least. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David. I think mm -hmm. that will be all. Yeah. Um,
yeah, thank you so much for answering all of mine and all of the audience's questions. I really appreciate it. And for the wonderful talk, it was really great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, everyone. If you have any questions, like I said, just shoot me an email, david at inspiritai.com. And uh, yeah, really appreciated the time. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.